going to show the exact books that made me go from a complete amateur at the end of high school all the way to reading graduate level texts within the space of four years. We'll follow my journey where you'll see all the books that helped me level up as a mathematician. I'm going to point out the traps to avoid on your mathematical journey, many of which I've fallen into myself, and I'll share what it actually feels like to level up and what it's like to read maths texts as you get better and better. For each topic, I'll single out the book that had a monumental impact on my development. And at the end, I'll show you some really unique hidden gems I'm sure you haven't seen before. We'll begin where it all started. Proofs. I have not been able to find a single person on YouTube talk about this book. And this is a real shame because a lot of the questions I'm getting asked at the moment are along the lines of, I'm a beginner, I want to learn how to write proofs. How can I best make this transition to advance undergraduate maths? And for me, this book worked wonders. You see, my interest in maths sparked quickly, but it also sparked very late. I set myself this ambitious, somewhat delusional goal of going to do maths at Cambridge, and my interviews were coming up very soon. So I looked at the recommended reading list for incoming undergraduates, and that's where I found out about this book. This book markets itself as a bridge. On one end of the bridge is high school maths, which it describes as essentially learning a set of algorithms. And the other end of the bridge is the beauty and power of the ideas you meet in undergraduate maths. I think it's an excellent bridge. Firstly, I think it's so good because it's compassionate to the intended audience, which is someone who just has a grasp on high school maths. But the main reason I think it's so good is the structure. It starts by outlining the main methods of proof, and then the rest of the book is just building on itself, developing theory you'll meet in your first few years as an undergraduate. But by doing this, you really get a sense for why these methods of proof exist and why they're powerful. So mainly, a lot of the theory developed is number theory, and then at the end, there are introductory sections on analysis and group theory. To give you an example, the chapter on induction is followed by a really elegant application of induction to Euler's formula. There aren't that many moments in maths which will stay with you forever, but this was one of them. So I was reading about induction and in school, at least in the UK, when you learn about induction, it's just to do things like proof formulas along the lines of some of the first n numbers, some of the first n squares, etc. When I read this and saw this, which is using induction to prove something from geometry, I mean, it really blew me away. And uh, I really got a sense of just how powerful induction can be. But to give you an idea of where you might end up if you use this book, well, here's the introduction to groups at the end. It starts with basic definitions and then it ends up proving Lagrange's theorem. So in, in this sense, it acts as a guide to showing you where you can go from here. There's the proof of Lagrange's theorem. And for analysis, it starts with a chapter on supremum and infimum and then limits, sequences, and it builds up to prove the monotone convergence theorem. Then this is followed by a chapter on continuity, which is it's very difficult concepts, especially at this stage, but it's very, very rewarding if you spend time on it and you prove the intermediate value theorem. But speaking of analysis, this takes us on to the next chapter, my first real mathematical love. Analysis is where things really started to take off for me. I'll be honest, before starting my undergrad, the summer before starting, I wanted to read ahead and I chose analysis for no reason other than that. <laughs> I just heard it was the most difficult undergraduate course. I mean, there was no nothing more to my decision, but looking back now, <laughs> I'm so glad I did because it matured me a lot, but it really wasn't easy. I mean, I spent hours poring over single pages of this book, um, but this book is great. You've likely heard about it before and it deserves every praise that it gets. The reason why I think it's so good is because of how the chapters are structured. So for example, the derivative chapter. Every chapter starts with a discussion section and this really sets the scene. It says, why are we talking about this? What questions can we ask and what questions can we reasonably have a chance of being able to answer? And this is something that I don't think books do enough. 
I think to have a really enriching learning experience, you, you constantly want to have a sense of where are we going? Why are we talking about this? What is the aim? So I think this is great. So for the derivative, it's essentially saying, well, if we have a function which is nice, whatever that means, it means you can take the derivative at every point. Well, does this mean that the function which is the derivative, does that have to be nice? And it asks other questions as well along the lines of, can you have a function which is everywhere continuous but nowhere differentiable? And that really goes against your intuition you learn from school. Now, then you get into the main body of text, which is the standard contents of a first course. And then finally, the final section is an enrichment section. So here it's constructing a continuous newer differentiable function. This is great because it's enriching, but the details are left as an exercise. So it doesn't weigh down the main body of text. And from this perspective, if you see my reviews of Tau and Pew, it walks the line between them in that it has the contents of a first course and it has enriched material, but it's not overwhelming. And then finally, each chapter ends with an epilogue where it reviews the key points and uh, also asks more questions, more places to go off and explore, which is great. So I think this is an excellent text. I don't think you would go wrong by choosing this. But this book in particular is about to find a new home in uh, the house of one of my members in America. So it's, uh, it's time to say goodbye, but it really served me really well. Now for complex analysis, I want to use this as an example of a trap you can fall into. And that is often on your journey, you'll encounter a book which you, you know is quite a way beyond you. But for me at least, I'll think, well, <laughs> even if there's a chance that I just grit my teeth and learn this stuff, think how much better I would be. But uh, this, is, um, this, is, this is a trap. And there's a good chance that the book would just end up at the back of your shelf. And of course, there's nothing wrong with this because you can always come back and revisit it later. But it can be a bit demotivating when you have to just give up on a book. And this was the case for me with this book. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I was just looking through the contents and was thinking, well, imagine if I could just, just learn all this. And this goes way beyond the course I was doing at the time. Um, but yeah, it's it ended up at the back of my shelf and yet to be read. But I'm really hoping to come back to it when I'm ready for it, because I think it's a bit of a hidden gem, but I can't say anything more about it than that at the moment, unfortunately. Now, on to functional analysis. And these are here because this marked the point for me in my journey where I was now able to read from multiple sources, and it didn't matter if there was different notation or the theory was built in different ways. I could translate between them and really reap the benefits from multiple sources. And this is a skill which is really important, but it takes time to build. I mean, it's very difficult as a beginner to read multiple books concurrently without just being confused. And I've talked about this book, my first video on this channel. And all I can say about Bolabash is it's hard, but it has some really challenging, but interesting, unique exercises. What I want to say about this is that in my opinion, don't do a topology course for the sake of a topology course. You want to do it alongside courses that require you to have a course in topology. It requires the results. This book, my lecturer said, if you're struggling to fall asleep at night, then this might be for you. <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. Finally, differential geometry. Now, I've included this book because there's a lot of analysis needed to do differential geometry. This course was hugely impactful in my journey. And I think mainly that's because I had a really excellent enthusiastic supervisor and a good lecturer. And this is really common. It's really common in maths that where your interests end up are heavily influenced by the people around you. But this course came at the right time for me because analysis was starting to feel like just a catalogue of results. Like the, the content on differentiation from Rn to Rm was really dense and I couldn't see why it was that important. But this gave it all a reason. This book I think is really good. There's lots of visuals, lots of colour, and it's just presented in a really excite, exciting, engaging way. And the exercises are really good. 
Now it's time to move on to a topic in maths, which if you've watched the channel for a while, you'll know I have some serious issues with how it's being taught. Algebra. Now, to quickly summarise, what I think the big problem with how algebra is taught is that to an algebraist, it is incredibly clear why you want to study certain algebraic systems and how the theory should develop because they've done it all their life and they've seen so many examples. But to the beginner, I want to get inside the minds of the people developing the theory because, for example, groups, ultimately, it became clear that it was a fruitful thing to study largely because of Galois' study of polynomial equations. But it takes three years to get to Galois theory in a typical undergraduate degree. And it's this lack of genuine motivation that has created a lot of friction between me and engaging with algebra. But getting into the books, these three books on the top here essentially contain most of what you'll see in undergraduate algebra. The book in the, in the middle by Cohn contains a bit less, but essentially they are a collection of all of undergraduate algebra. But Basic Algebra 1 by Jacobson is by far the most comprehensive, but also the most difficult. And it's the book that I've singled out as being the most impactful on my journey from algebra, but not because it's so good, but because it played a big part in helping me understand modules. Now, module theory is quite tough. And in my course, at least, it also lacked motivation. I mean, it's not obvious that weakening the field requirement to an arbitrary ring for a vector space is going to be fruitful because it seems almost a bit too weak. But I really persevered and put in a lot of work to try and understand the results. And slowly we built up to the structure theorem for finitely generated modules over Euclidean domains. And I could sort of see things fitting together. And then at the end, you do something really clever, which is to consider a vector space as an FX module and out pops Jordan normal form. And at that moment, all the pieces fit together and everything made sense. And that, this was a really powerful moment. And it's another one of those that I would just never forget. Now, this next book, Algebra and Geometry by Bearden, I want to use this as a warning for another trap that people commonly fall into. Indeed, I did. This book is essentially a companion to the first year courses at Cambridge in linear algebra and groups. And it does it through a unifying lens of geometry. But what this means is that there's a lot of enriching material which aren't in a standard first course in those two things like spherical geometry, quaternions. It takes 100 pages of this book to actually define a vector space, but at the time, I couldn't allocate space in my mind to read this because at the time, my interests were in just getting to bigger and bigger results in the courses that I was doing, but actually not stopping and looking around because often there's so much theory which you can access with the current level of power of machinery you've built. But people often don't stop and look around. And at points in your journey, it can be so enriching to actually just take a step back and do some exploring with the current level of machinery and tools you've built. And I would have developed so much more in both those first year courses had I just done some exploration on the side with this book. Now, these three books are my attempt to solve this motivation issue I've been talking about with algebra. And if you've seen the channel before, you for sure know the middle book. And the review, the full rundown of everything is coming very soon. I don't want to give too much away, but what I can say is that this book is algebra with the guiding light being number theory. Of course, this book is algebra with the guiding light being Galois theory. And this book here takes a rings first before groups approach. And this is something you can make a good case for, but it's not for everybody. But now we come to some really quite heavy texts. We made it. This is the point where I'm currently at four years later. And I think this point is best described by these two pretty challenging texts. You see, I realized that I don't love algebra just for the sake of algebra. And I don't love analysis just for the sake of analysis. But when you put them together to do things like in algebraic topology, that's what really excites me. This book here by Hatcher, very famous. You've likely heard of it, but it's also quite controversial. For me, I really like it. It's been quite a pleasant read and it's helped me a lot with my university course, which asks really quite a lot of an undergraduate. To give you an example, in my course, to define simplicial homology, there are first three pages of algebra 
and slog to get to the definition. But there's no discussion of what the idea of homology even is. And so when you get to the definition, I was exhausted and just confused. And this is not just me. So many people lose interest in the course at this point. But when I read this book, it starts with some chat, essentially, on the idea of homology. And it's great. When I read this, it became so clear what it means to mod out cycles by boundaries and what the idea is. So if you're struggling with homology, then read that. But the next book is by Lee. And this is also really good. It sort of has um, a constant flavor of manifolds throughout, which Hatcher doesn't. But it, what's really good is it has a full comprehensive review of topology at the beginning. So if you feel your foundations are a little bit shaky, then it's great. And it works up to classification of compact surfaces. It's time for some hidden gems, and I'd be so surprised if anyone had seen all three of these before. The first is a concise text on advanced linear algebra. Now, this is linear algebra, but wherever possible, using methods in analysis. <laughs> and at the time, I was big into analysis, so I had to buy the book when I saw it. It's definitely not a standard first course. Do not use it as a first course. But if you're comfortable with how a standard first course is developed, and you really like analysis, then this is very interesting. To give you an example, well, the chapter on determinants motivates determinants by showing that the calculation of the topological degree of a differentiable map from the closed curve to the unit circle involves calculating a two by two determinant. I mean, and then it goes on to develop determinants in a fairly non-standard way, which is inductively instead of using permutations. And then it proved Cayley Hamilton by showing that the set of complex matrices with distinct eigenvalues is dense. It proves that using methods from analysis. So it's very non-standard, but it's really interesting to see. So if this has piqued your interest, definitely take a look at a preview, but bear in mind it is non-standard. Next up is an invitation to representation theory. Now I struggled with representation theory. Well, firstly, the lecturer was a bit all over the place, but as a course as a whole, it is a bit all over the place in terms of notation. And there are lots of ways it can be introduced into an undergraduate degree. So for me, in my case, it made it very difficult to find a book which looked anything like my course. That was until I found this book. Now, this book markets itself as a friendly introduction to representation theory, and it's really good. It's friendly, it shows you the power of representation theory, and it also developed theory past my course, all in about 200 pages. Yeah, 200 pages. So if you want to learn representation theory, I think this is a great place to start. I mean, representation theory appears so much in different areas in maths, but you don't really get that impression from a first course. And people often end up saying, oh, I really wish I'd put more effort into representation theory as an undergrad. So if you're interested, take a look. I think this is a really good place to start. And finally, this is essentially a set of lecture notes translated from Russian. But I think this is really good because the problem I had with algebraic topology is that a lot of the problems require a very different framework of thinking, which I hadn't encountered at that point in my undergrad. But books on algebraic topology, it seems to be the standard that solutions are not included. So it's very difficult to try and develop this framework of thinking. But this is why this book is so great. It markets itself as a toolkit for the student because it contains hints and solutions to all the problems. So it really helps you out with what I was talking about. But also the content is really well presented. I mean, the chapter on simplicial complexes really helped me out because it can get quite dense and abstract. Like here, for example, a picture of the open star. I just think it it's great and it matched my course really well. So I'm a big fan of this book. And so the books that have had the biggest impact on helping me level up are Algebraic Topology by Hatcher, Jacobson Basic Algebra One, Understanding Analysis by Abbott, and for proofs where it all started, A Concise Introduction to Pure Mathematics by Liebeck. And let me know which books have had the biggest impact on your journey.